Like many people, every once in a while, I like to sit back and relax and enjoy a bit of science fiction. While these films and television shows overwhelm us with eye candy and capture our imaginations, often the technical inaccuracies tend to be more entertaining than the production itself. In this series, we'll be delving into these various circumstances and highlighting the various scenes that I consider the most problematic. Yes, I think it's pretty clear to all that I'm quite the James Bond fan. I mean, just look at my intro for the Moonfaker series. And yes, the title of which is obviously a takeoff of the 1979 Bond film. People love to complain about Moonraker, how they felt that the producers were just competing with Star Wars and that Outer Space doesn't belong in a James Bond movie. These critics seem to have overlooked the fact that a space theme was worked into Dr. No, the first Bond film, although 007 didn't fly in space himself. Personally, I think it's an okay movie, but the biggest gripe I have would have to be the opening sequence which this whole movie is focused on. In the beginning of the film, the British Royal Air Force is transporting a Moonraker space shuttle atop a Boeing 747. How are we doing, Richard? We should pass over the English coast 15 minutes ahead of time, sir. Well, with this load on our back, that's good going. Just trust the RAF, sir. <laughs> Unbeknownst to them, two hijackers have stowed aboard the shuttle. They get behind the controls and ignite the shuttle's main engines, launching it off the back of the 747. What the hell is that? The shuttle ignition. This is just plain ridiculous, as this hijacking scenario doesn't even follow the basic design of the space shuttle. Put simply, what's fueling these engines? There are no propellants carried aboard the actual shuttle. The cargo bay is used for just that, cargo. Instead, these engines are fed by an external source, that big brown tank we see when the shuttle is on the launch pad. The fuel and the oxidizer are stored in the external tank, and are pumped into the combustion chamber via a connecting pipe. In fact, the tank is so heavy that two solid booster rockets are required to carry that extra weight. The shuttle can only lift 30 tons and the external tank weighs about 800 tons fully loaded. With the external tank jettisoned or otherwise disconnected, these three engines are essentially dead and useless. So the shuttle hijacking depicted in Moonraker is ludicrous. Being fair, Perhaps the producers were basing this hijacking off the approach and landing tests. Prior to Moonraker's release, NASA had devised a method of simulating the shuttle touchdown. A crewed space shuttle Enterprise would ride atop the back of a Boeing 747. The space shuttle would then detach from the Boeing and make an unpowered glide across the United States to the runway. Of course, Enterprise was not equipped with these three engines. It had no need for them, as they were not used during the landing phase of any shuttle mission. In fact, they are not even used during the orbital phase of the mission. By the time the tank is jettisoned, the shuttle is held in orbit by the Earth's gravity. Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion, which in turn was based on the findings of Galileo, states that a body continues at rest or in uniform motion in a straight line unless acted upon by some force. One such form of force is called drag, or air resistance. As an aeroplane flies, it continuously runs into air, which in turn slows it down. To remain flying, the plane needs to maintain constant velocity, hence the need for the engines to be operating during the entire flight. If all the engines failed, the plane would quickly run into a lot of air resistance and come falling back down to Earth. 
The Space Shuttle is free of that problem. The Space Shuttle main engines accelerate the shuttle to a velocity of 27,000 km per hour, and it is still travelling at that speed once it has left the atmosphere. Therefore, there is no drag. No force to act upon the shuttle, and therefore nothing to slow down its uniform motion. Hence the main engines are no longer required. The only engines the shuttle uses in space are thrusters in the nose and tail sections for manoeuvring and changing its orbit, and retro rockets to deaccelerate the shuttle enough to fall back down to Earth. So the bottom line is, this hijacking scene makes no sense. Put simply, Drax's men hijack the shuttle by firing engines that should by any definition be unpowered. Now for argument's sake, Let's just entertain the idea that maybe there were some propellants stored in the cargo bay. The space shuttle uses liquid hydrogen as the fuel and liquid oxygen, or LOX, as the oxidizer. Here's where additional problems arise. Oxygen has a very low boiling point, minus 183 degrees Celsius to be exact. To keep it in liquid form, the tank must be kept at minus 240 degrees Celsius. That's about five and a half times as cold as Antarctica. And even then, when sitting on the launch pad where the outdoor temperatures can range from minus 1 to 40 degrees Celsius, the oxygen can only be stored in liquid form for a few hours before it starts to warm up and turn back into a gas. And in gaseous form, oxygen tends to want to occupy a lot of volume. In conventional use, this is not necessarily a problem, as you could easily use thick-walled steel tanks to contain it. Rocket scientists do not have that luxury, because the more mass you add to the rocket, you will subsequently require more fuel to lift that extra mass, so ideally you want to make the tank as lightweight as possible. This leads to an obvious flaw when working with oxygen. As oxygen turns from liquid to gas, the buildup of too much gas inside this lightweight tank would cause it to burst. As anyone within the aerospace industry would know, to prevent this from happening, you would need to vent out the excess gaseous oxygen. You might have seen the videos of the shuttle on the launch pad, in which a white gas can be seen spraying down the side. That would be the water vapour that condenses around the super cold gaseous oxygen being released to prevent the tank from bursting. Hydrogen also has the same shortcomings as oxygen, and as an added bonus, the hydrogen tank must be stronger than the oxygen tank, because of its very small atomic size, hydrogen can easily escape through any microscopic hole in the tank, hence the need to properly weld it. You could of course eliminate this problem by replacing the hydrogen fuel with kerosene. Like the petrol in your car, it can remain in liquid form at room temperature indefinitely and doesn't require any special treatment to contain it. The only advantage hydrogen has over kerosene is that it packs more of a kick. But even though you've eliminated the hydrogen problem, you've still got to deal with the oxygen problem. At cruising altitudes, the air temperature is generally around minus 60 degrees Celsius. That's cold, but not cold enough to keep the oxygen in liquid form. According to the film, the RAF is transporting the shuttle from California to the UK. This flight would have taken at least 11 hours much longer than the time it would have taken the oxygen to turn back into a gas and rupture the tank. Keep in mind too that oxygen is extremely volatile and will happily burn on itself. When you couple this with the fact that there is also hydrogen aboard, the Boeing 747 and the Moonraker shuttle would both have become a spectacular firebomb the instant the oxygen tank ruptured. So no matter how you look at it, this hijacking scene is impossible and makes no sense whatsoever. A better hijacking scenario would have been to have the hijackers plant a bomb aboard the Boeing 747, detach the shuttle, glide it away from the plane, and then detonate the bomb. It's much more plausible than what's depicted in the film.